Good morning. Good morning. This morning, we are all in a battle. But what does that battle look like? What weapons do we have to fight in that battle? Who are we even fighting in this battle? These are all questions that we're going to look at today as we worship in God's house. We'll begin with the gathering right found in page two of your service folder. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. For what we have done and left undone, we fall on your countless mercies. For sins that are relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. God exalted him to the highest place 
and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. For hearts that are cold, for seizing control, for scorning our very Maker. In thought, word, and deed, we failed you, our King. How deeply we need a Savior. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First scripture lesson this morning comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings chapter 18. This text records a showdown between God's prophet Elijah and the false prophets of the false god Baal. But really it's a showdown between the one true almighty God and the forces of Satan himself. And in this text, the winner of that showdown is clear. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. <clears throat> but the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, Am I the only one of the Lord's prophets left? But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves, and let them cut it into pieces, and put it on the wood, but not set, it to fi not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. 
with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars of water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson comes from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Because we too are in a battle against the devil and all of his evil forces, followers of Christ are called to put on the full armor of God. Paul writes, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. This too is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Alleluia. Now in honor of the words and works of our Savior, please stand for today's gospel. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 9. Glory be to you, O Lord. These words will also serve as the basis for today's sermon. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. The man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. 
When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's now join in confessing our faith. We'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed that are printed on the top of page 7. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our hymn of the day.
There's not many things that Denver, Colorado is missing. It's like the mountains provide an all-you-can-eat buffet of hiking and skiing. And if you can't find a place to eat, then you're just plain picky. But there is one thing that Denver is missing. Denver, Colorado is landlocked. No ocean. But to be completely honest, I've always been more of a lake kind of guy anyways, and Denver has some of those too. The ocean has just, it's always been a lot. The endless expanse in the bottomless depth, countless ships abandoned, countless lives claimed. Weird, creepy, crawly creatures, those are common in the ocean and those are king in the ocean. And even on that so-called safest part, the beach, you have your unseen danger there too. You just never know when a riptide will smoothly whisk you away from the safety of the shoreline. You could be there swimming with friends and family, all of you having a grand old time, and all of you in the lurking grip of the ocean, and you would have no idea. The disciples were caught in a spiritual riptide. Casting out demons, that, that's a part of the job description if you're a disciple. Just three chapters ago in Mark, Jesus had given them the authority to take care of business when it came to this kind of thing. This should have just been another ordinary day on the job. But their comfortability in their fight against Satan had exposed a spiritual chink in their spiritual armor. The disciples woefully underestimated their enemy and frankly, woefully overestimated themselves. And now there was no going through, around, over, or under the brick wall that was this demon possession. Uh-oh. If you're the disciples, what do you do? Did they all gather in line and try their own hand at it one at a time? Did they try a big group effort, put their brains together? Perhaps they had the boy stand up, turn around, sit down, and everything in between. But did they really think that Satan and this demon were just going to roll over because they told them to? Did they really forget that Satan is like a prowling lion looking for someone to devour the second their guard is down and their guard is more than down here? But before we continue our favorite pastime of taking pot shots at the disciples, what about you? Do you realize the spiritual riptide that you are caught in? Do you sense the unseen danger hunting you? Satan may not work in such obvious ways as much as he used to, but you better believe that he is busier than ever. The slander he spreads, maybe it's not heard directly from his own lips, but it sure is heard from one another across the political aisle. On the debate stage of social media, your backyard, even the dinner table, the hate Satan inflicts, maybe it's not inflicted right on our body, but it sure is felt in the loveless actions of a broken family. Satan's army, it may not line up right in front of us, but his army sure does persecute with subtle jabs and judgments, and that's if you're lucky. But his most petty and his highest priority is just to drag you all the way down to hell right with them. And all he has to do, and all he wants to do, is plant a little whisper in your head. God doesn't love me. God couldn't love me. God will never love me. And we're just getting started here. Satan has so many weapons in his arsenal that he would love to attack you with. But you better believe that when Satan launches his flaming arrows our way, we are launching our own right back. 
That person believes in what? They need to get shut down and they need to shut up. My family member, my spouse, my child, my sibling, they said what to me? I am so sick of them, I am so done with them. Those people don't want to hear about Jesus? Fine. They're not going to hear about Jesus. God doesn't love me. Who? Me? I'll give God a reason to love me. And so, under the protection of our own banner and armed with our own weapons of bravery, courage, and wits, we take that fight to Satan just like the disciples did. How long until you think Satan wins that fight? That is, that fight against him on your own without Jesus. He won the second you thought you could ever win that fight against him on your own without Jesus. He won the second his spiritual riptide whisked you far away, pitting you against him on your own without Jesus, and now he has you right where he wants you, right in his grip, so eager and so ready to kill you and destroy you physically and spiritually, just like the boy in our story. And it's all because we and the disciples underestimated our enemy, and we overestimated ourselves. And what do you think Jesus would have to say about that? You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? You unbelieving generation. You call yourselves Christians? Did you forget who I am? Don't you realize this isn't some spiritual scuffle, but a battle, a war? How long? How long until you fight under the protection of my banner? How long until you exchange your bravery, wits, and courage for humility in reliance on me, you unbelieving generation. But Jesus just can't help himself, can he? Listen to his very next words. Bring the boy to me. Bring the boy to me. Let me show you how you win this fight, dear disciples, dear Christians. So they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And there it is. How ironic. Because in an unexpected twist, we're actually going to learn something from Satan's demon this morning. Jesus is Lord of all. We and the disciples, we may be quick to forget that fact, but Satan and his demons, they never forget that fact. They could care less when we attack them on our own. In fact, they love it when we do that because that's a battle that they know they're going to win. But when you run to Jesus, they fear. They tremble. They shriek. They lose. So run to Jesus. Take this battle out of your own hands and force it into the palms of Jesus. They're big enough for all of it. And he wants all of it. He wants the spiritual scuffles you underestimate. He wants the big battles that you've been wrestling with for so long. He wants the big, bulky, prideful weapons we wield. He wants it all. Turn to your Savior to fight for you. Arm yourself with prayer to him and with faith and trust in him. Ask big and see how Jesus comes to your aid. The boy's father ran to Jesus. Mark tells us that Jesus asked, asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Did you catch it? Take pity on us. Help us. 
Imagine for a second the lifelong, irreversible scars inflicted on this boy's body. Just a kid. Satan and his demons don't play fair. Imagine the father's broken heart for his broken boy. Satan and his demons do not play fair. Satan's riptide has been dragging this family away to the spiritual sea of despair for far, far too long. So long, in fact, that the father had a terrible, dreadful, looming feeling. This demon was not ever going to go away. Did you catch it? If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus, if you can. But I don't know if you can. I just don't know anymore. And so immediately Jesus casted out that demon to prove that he can. Right? Well, Mark records for us that Jesus replied and he said, if you can... Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Remember, the father rightly ran to Jesus. He knew he needed Jesus. He couldn't fix this by his own power. He believed in Jesus. But the father just could not reconcile the feeling that he had that his Jesus and his pain could do anything to each other besides reach a stalemate. He believed in Jesus. He knew how great he was, how powerful he was. But he knew his pain, how great it was, how overwhelming it was. So what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? For the boy's father, he could not fathom the unstoppable force of Jesus actually coming to a grinding halt, yet He also just could not imagine the immovable object that was this demon possession actually giving any sort of ground. And so what bubbles forth from his heart is a faith-filled prayer sprinkled with a little doubt. I do believe, Jesus, but please help me overcome my unbelief. Jesus knew the pain of that father He knows your pain, too. And when he's met with that tension in our hearts, he's not going to turn you away and call you an unbelieving generation. When we cry out to him with a heart broken and a heartfelt prayer, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. See how Jesus responds to his children. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. You feel real pain and trauma in this world, just like the boy and his father. You know the cold, hard facts of life that make you cry out to Jesus, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. I'm not even going to try and voice that pain for you this morning because frankly, it is far beyond my comprehension and ability to do so, but you know it. You felt it, you've lived it. Jesus has a message for you. When you lean on him and you lean on his promises, he always delivers. I like to imagine all of the people that Jesus was speaking to when he said to that demon, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. I think he was speaking to the boy. How comforting for this boy who had been deaf and mute. The very first words he hears are from his Savior telling this demon to come out of him and never enter him again. And even after Jesus had healed him and he collapsed to the ground, giving everyone every reason to shout out, he's dead, Jesus picked him up by the hand 
and gave him the strength to stand on his own two feet against Satan's physical and spiritual attacks. I think he was speaking to the Father. How comforting for the Father to witness his Savior banish and destroy his greatest fear and to realize that his greatest fear, it's not coming back. Never again. I think he was speaking to the disciples too. This demon came out of this boy not because of who they were and how hard they tried, but because of who Jesus is and through his name alone. Jesus was telling them that he is the one that fights this battle. He was telling them, don't you dare overestimate yourselves again. Don't you dare underestimate your enemy and don't you even think about underestimating me. Never again. And of course, Jesus was speaking to that destroyer, that killer, Satan, and all of his angels. He told them to never enter that boy again. And when he picked up his cross and made his death march to Golgotha, he was saying, never again will my children wonder who I am and what I did for them. And when Satan struck Jesus' heel with the sting of death, Jesus crushed his head and he shouted, never again will my children wonder who wins this fight. And after three days dead, when Jesus walked out of his tomb alive and well, he was saying, never again will your sin separate you from my Father in heaven. And on that last day, when we meet Jesus in heaven or he comes down here to earth, he's going to say to us, never again will you feel the burden of sin. When Jesus said never again to Satan and to sin, he showed us a new way, a better way, the only way to fight Satan. Too often we sling slander at one another, never again. Too often we are quick to accuse, slow to forgive, Never again. Too often we tremble in fear when we think about standing before the judgment throne of God. Never again. And too often we despair when Satan throws everything he's got at us. Never again. Because it is so clear. When we know who Jesus is and what he's done for us, we will never trust in anyone or in anything besides Jesus to fight that battle against Satan. And so just as Paul wrote in Ephesians, we are so happy and so eager to put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, we may be able to stand our ground and after we have done everything to stand. You are in a spiritual riptide. You are oh so well aware of that fact. The waves wash over you. The drowning sensation is familiar. That drowning sensation may never go away on this earth. But you will never drown. Jesus picks us up by the hand and he walks us safely to shore. It's when you give up your pride and pick up humility that Jesus starts to carry you. That you start to learn the lesson he wants you to know. He is always there for you, so eager and so ready to pick you up in all of life's spiritual riptides. Don't just take his word for it. Take his actions for it. Take his death for it. Take his resurrection for it. And now in our fight against Satan, we look at Jesus and we say, I am not doing that on my own. Never again. Amen. We will now gather our offering gifts to the Lord. If you're a visitor with us this morning, welcome. If you'd like to leave a record of your attendance, feel free to fill out that connection card in front of you. You can put it in the offering plate as it comes around, or you can hand it to an usher. Thank you. Thank you. 
We'll now continue with our prayer of the church, followed by the Lord's Prayer. When it comes time for special prayers today, we'll say one for the family of our sister in Christ, Tony Hoover. Uh, Tony was one of the members of our church family who has been homebound for much of the last decade, and the Lord, in his wisdom, called Tony home to heaven uh, yesterday evening. So we'll say a prayer especially for Tony's husband, Chuck, uh, and those who mourn her loss. Please stand for prayer. Triune God, you are the one eternal God whose name we praise forever. We would not have known you if you had not revealed yourself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, yet one God. Remove from us all doubt and grant us humble faith as we contemplate this high and holy mystery and enlighten and empower us to worship you as the triune God. God our Father, whatever is good in us, whatever good things we have, whatever good we do, comes from you alone. In you we live and move and have our being. Please open up our eyes to see the gifts you provide every day purely out of your own love and care. Lord Jesus, our Savior, you came into our world to make the Father known to us. You joined yourself to us by taking on our humanity and brought us back to God by shedding your blood. In love, you walked the way of suffering and carried the wrath of God that we deserved because of our sins. Help us believe that all you did and all you endured, you did to rescue us and to set us free. In the bright new hope of your resurrection, teach us to offer our lives in praise to God and in love to our neighbor. Dear Creator, Spirit, you breathed into us new life by the power of the gospel. You opened our eyes to see the light of your grace, and you filled our minds with the clear sound of your voice. Through word and sacrament, lead us to understand more completely how broad and deep and high is the love of God in Christ Jesus. Firm up our resolve to do battle with Satan and with sin. In all of our weaknesses be our strength, that we may show ourselves to be God's children, faithful in prayer, constant in hope, and fervent in love. Heavenly Father, comfort the family of our sister in Christ, Tony Hoover, whom you have now called to eternal glory in heaven. We praise you for making Tony your child in baptism and sustaining her faith throughout, through the good news of Jesus our Savior. May the peace and promise of your son's atoning sacrifice on the cross and his empty tomb bring assurance to the hearts of all who mourn, especially Tony's husband, Chuck. Help us always to live in joyful anticipation of the day when you will call us from our graves, reunite us with Tony and all believers, and fill us with perfect bliss in your presence forever. Now hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Dear Lord, you are the God of glory, the God of grace, and the God of all comfort. We rejoice to call you Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise your name now and forever. And we also join in your name to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. The Sacrament, page 8. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Pray 
praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me then he took the cup gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always principles that God teaches us in his word about reception of the sacrament are summarized for you on the bottom of page 9. Out of love for those principles, we ask that only members of this congregation or another Wisconsin Synod congregation come forward uh, to receive the sacrament this morning. During distribution, we'll hear our vocalists sing the hymn, Still My Soul Be Still. If you'd like to follow along with the words of that for your meditation, they're printed in the, the pew hymnals, the blue hymnals, hymn 834. We also thank Wendy Schaefer for playing the piano during distribution after that hymn. Come for all things are now prepared. Still, my soul, be still, and do not fear. The winds of change may rage tomorrow. God is at your side, no longer dread the fires of unexpected sorrow. God, you are my God, 
and I will trust in you and not be shaken. Lord of peace, renew a steadfast spirit within me to rest in you alone. To
Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. closing hymn is Afflicted Saint to Christ Draw Near. Note the vocalists will sing stanzas one and two as well as the refrain the first time. The congregation can then join in on stanzas two and, or three and four and all the following refrains. Good morning to all of you. 
Thanks for joining us in God's house for worship. It's great to see you here. Announcements that you need to know are in the news and notes section of the service folder as well as the calendar. I'll highlight a few things. Um, uh, a Christian victory service for Randy Courier has officially been set for Friday, September 27th at 11 a.m. here at Zion. Uh, so that's not this coming Friday, but the Friday after that. 11 a.m. here at Zion, there'll be a light lunch to follow that the women of Zion will put on. Also, I uh, sent out a Zion update last night, and we prayed for the family of our sister in Christ, Tony Hoover, whom the Lord called home to heaven yesterday evening. Um, meeting with Chuck later, talked to him last night, and we'll be planning a service for Tony at some point in the next couple weeks as well. No firm details about that yet, but when we have them, uh, we'll certainly let you know about them. Also note our first Foundations Bible class of the year. We're scheduled to have at least two of them, uh, primarily for new school families to, to get to know what we believe, teach, and confess is coming up this Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. We'd also love to have as many members of Zion attend that class as possible, both for uh, a study yourself as you grow in faith and refresh those truths, uh, but also to be there as hopefully some of our school families are also learning those truths of God's Word. Again, that's Wednesday night at 6 down in the fellowship hall and as always you're invited to go downstairs for fellowship time after we're ushered out today or after you're dismissed uh, we'll continue our bible class on words for the adults and all of the youth and sunday school kids will be over in the school for their bible study time as well take this chance to say hi to those who worshiped with you and whenever you're ready you can come and greet me and vicar at the back you don't need to wait for the people in the front if you're in the back you can leave whenever you want